So Martin, we talked a lot about vaccine mandates the last time, but let, let's look at the vaccines themselves. There's a lot of, uh, let's, let's say, varied information and misinformation around the vaccines themselves. In your mind today, as we're doing this interview, where are we at? What can the vaccines do? What can't they do? What's their usefulness? Well, they are very good at one thing and not so successful at another. What they're very good at is to prevent mortality toward death and also serious disease. So we know that uh, the efficacy of these uh, vaccines for preventing death is in the 90s, which means that in st- of 100 people that would have died, now maybe uh, only 5 or 10 of those will die because of the vaccine, because they are vaccinated. So that's a huge uh, benefit. So these vaccines are saving a lot of lives. And of course, since the mortality is mainly among the older, so anybody can get infected by COVID, but it's really the older people who have at risk for dying here. There's more than a thousand fold difference in risk between the oldest and the youngest. So these vaccines are saving the lives of many older people. And if they haven't had COVID and if they haven't had the vaccine, older people should definitely get it. Uh, To me, that's sort of a no brainer. So that's the good thing that the vaccine is doing. Now, one thing that they don't perform very well is to prevent uh, transmission and to prevent uh, my being infected or prevent uh, uh, symptomatic disease of a more mild uh, version. So we now know that it does prevent, it, it does reduce symptomatic disease for a few months, but that wanes fairly quickly. Um, so. The vaccine can stop the transmission of this virus. So, for example, we saw in Iceland, which has uh, a lot of uh, very high vaccination rate, they still had a wave uh, of uh, COVID, which was mainly transmitted through people who were vaccinated. So, uh, uh, everybody uh, pretty much are going to eventually uh, get this disease if they survive, if they live long enough, uh, whether they are vaccinated or not. Uh, but the, the risk from dying from, the, uh, from COVID is much less if you have the vaccine. And of course, if you're old, then the risk of dying is high. So then you absolutely want to have the vaccine if you haven't had COVID already. So, you know, you've been a very avid critic of the lockdowns. And this was, you know, part of the Great Barrington Declaration was a critique of that particular policy. There's still a few places in the world that are actively doing lockdowns, like in Australia, for example. And through the lockdowns, they've managed to keep their cases down and their, the disease down, um, and they're adamantly staying on that course. And what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think they have proved that uh, you can't suppress and eradicate this disease, which we knew already, of course. But they tried and they failed because they now have many, many cases in Australia. So uh, what lockdowns can do uh, is to sort of push things into the future, but it can't stop it from eventually coming and eventually spreading. So in Australia, as in other places of the world, uh, most people are eventually going to be infected by COVID. So also there, of course, it's important for all the people to get vaccinated. But uh, this idea that you can eradicate COVID or that you can suppress it and control it, that doesn't work for disease like COVID. Uh, smallpox, we have eradicated. Uh, that works. Uh, we have eradicated rinderpest. Those are the only two diseases that we have eradicated. Polio can be eradicated uh, if you put more effort into it. But uh, a disease like uh, COVID or uh, like the flu or any other of the coronaviruses, uh, they cannot be eradicated. It's something that we will uh, live with for forever. And we, I guess as we live with other four common coronaviruses that, uh, that give us the common cold. So the pandemic is going to end, but it's going to move into an uh, endemic stage where it will be around. People will be infected occasionally as we get infected. That will sort of uh, trigger the immune system again. And we're not going to have the serious outcomes as we ever had because very few people will be uh, susceptible. At the same time, there will be some older people in the 80s, for example, the immune system has deteriorated and they might still die from uh, COVID when it becomes uh, endemic, just like people die from the flu or from any other many viruses when the immune system deteriorates and goes down. So in places like Australia, 
Um, so you're saying it's just basically a matter of time before they have to experience what any other place in the world has experienced, but perhaps with you know, high vaccinate, hopefully with high vaccination among the vulnerable people. Yeah, so that's the key for Australia to make sure that the older people get vaccinated and as close to 100% as possible. Uh, at the same time, children are at minuscule risk from uh, dying from COVID. So we don't have to worry about them being vaccinated. Uh, it's the old people who have to vaccinate. But then what happens is if you have these extreme lockdowns, they have negative consequences on public health, the collateral damage. And the longer you extend it, the more severe those problems will be. So, for example, we have uh, less cancer in 2020 and 21 compared to before. And that's not because there's less cancer, we're not detecting it. And if you're not detecting it, we're not treating them. Hmm. And that's not necessarily going to lead to death this year, but it, somebody might die now three or four years from now who would have lived 20 years. Uh, there's, there's collateral damage on cardiovascular disease, diabetes distreatment, and of course on the mental health. And then all the missed educations that kids didn't go to schools. They have long-term consequences both for their physical health and also for their, and of course education, but also for their, uh, their mental health and uh, their general well-being for, for as long as they live. Education is important. So yeah, and actually I want to talk a, a little bit later about this, about, you know, what we should be studying in order to kind of, you know, assess what the pandemic has really done to us, what treatments work and so forth. Before we go there, I want to talk a bit about the elephant in the room, so to speak. And this is something you've been uh, more recently very vocal about, which is just this whole idea of natural immunity. Um, it just seems like the whole concept of natural immunity is largely being ignored in policy, and which is, seems very odd. It is very strange. Uh, we have known about natural immunity since the Athenian plague in 430 BC. And I'm, not, I'm not talking about before COVID, I'm talking about before Christ. So for almost two and a half thousand years, we have known about natural immunity. So it's strange that suddenly people are questioning that. The purpose of the vaccine is to have a milder disease if you get infected. But if you already have been infected because maybe you were infected before the vaccine existed, then you already have excellent immunity. You have stronger, longer lasting immunity than you have from the vaccines. So this idea that you're gonna fire a nurse who was working in the COVID wards for many months, taking care of COVID patients who got infected, who recovered, and who now have better immunity than those hospital administrators who were sitting at home or doing Zoom meetings and who then got, didn't get COVID but got vaccinated, they have less immunity than this nurse who was at the front line taking care of patients. But now those administrators are firing those nurses, uh, even though they have better immunity. So we should do the opposite. Hospitals should hire nurses and other staff with natural immunity. And then they should assign those to uh, the geriatric wards where there are older people who are extra sensitive, who are frail. And even if they're vaccinated, they, they might have, they be at risk of, of dying from COVID. So uh, we should utilize uh, them to take care of older patients who are at risk. The same with nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes should go out and uh, try to uh, hire people who have natural immunity. They're the ones who are least likely to infect the residents. And we're doing the opposite, they're being fired. Uh, I don't understand how any hospital president who supposedly should uh, do what's best for the patients in the hospitals and take care for them, uh, and who supposedly should be enlightened and informed about these things, how they can uh, do the very opposite or what is best for their patients. Same with university presidents, they're supposed to be the beacons of the enlightenment and of knowledge, and they're going contrary to, to these basic facts that we have known about for, for a couple of thousand years. You know, so just this is pretty fascinating because you're basically saying that the, the hospital health workers with natural immunity can be kind of like the, 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 the front line of the focused protection program going forward, basically. Yes, yeah. And actually, that's what they did during the Athenian plague, uh, 430 B uh, BC. They used uh, people who had recovered from the plague to take care of uh, sick patients. 
Fascinating. So when it comes to infection, okay, is, is natural immunity better in preventing infection than vaccination? Is that what you're saying? Yes. So uh, there was one of the best studies was from Israel uh, and they looked at and they saw that if you have, if you're vaccinated, you are 27 times more likely to have symptomatic COVID disease compared to if you have natural immunity. Uh, with the conference interval between, I think it was 13 and 54 or something. So it's a big difference. And uh, when looking at the hospitalizations, there was also uh, more protection from natural immunity than from vaccine immunity. When it comes to death, there was zero death in both groups, so both the vaccinated and the, those with natural immunity were well protected against death, so that's good. But yeah, so the immunity is stronger and it's longer lasting uh, than uh, if you have a vaccine. And that's not a surprise. That's what we would expect. Uh, the vaccine sort of targeted a specific, specific part of the virus, while uh, natural immunity sort of have a more broad protection. It also has to do where the, the body encounters the virus for the first time. And if it's a natural infection, you encounter it first in your lungs, typically. If it's a vaccination, you, you do it in the, in the arms. So that might also have to do something with the comparing the protection uh, from the two. Well, sure. But what about, so we're, you're talking about, you know, symptoms here, but what about just infection itself? A lot of people out there are very concerned about getting infected with COVID. Well, um, the vaccine, it, it works, or the immune system works, so that if you get the virus in the body, then that's when the immune system sort of goes into effect. It's not like a Star Trek shield around you that prevents the virus from entering the body. The immune system cannot operate until the virus is in, in your body. And uh, when the virus enters, it takes some time for the immune system sometimes to sort of get up to speed. It depends on how long ago you had the vaccine or how long ago you had the, the natural disease. But uh, the fact that somebody tests positive is not really, in my mind, very interesting. If, uh, if we would test for all the viruses and anybody who was asymptomatic but tested positive because they had been uh, exposed, we would go nuts uh, worrying about all these viruses around there. So it's really the, the symptomatic disease that we should be concerned about as well as, of course, hospitalizations and death, which is the most important.